Yes. Okay. Oh, are you the host yet? First of yeah, all, you are. You have to know that every living thing has to survive all the four seasons or it would go extinct. So why are there seasons? Well, it starts with the sun. The sun provides all the energy for our planet. It makes trees grow. It makes leaves grow. The things that eat leaves, and that can be leaves, can be lettuce. Uh, the things that can eat, uh, that uh, animals eat uh, then becomes the energy that they have. So everything comes from the sun. And our sun is just another star. And the amazing thing is that there are sextillion stars in the world. I can't wrap my head around how many that is, but the scientists tell us it's approximately around the number of grains of sand on Earth, all Earth, not just in the United States, but all of Earth. Now, it's a sun that provides all that energy, a standard sun. The sun is large. It's the size of the 100, 110 times the size of Earth. So here you can see the sun, and this is Earth. This little blue dot over here is Earth. You can see how much bigger it is, so it's massive. How far away is it? Well, let's first look at the moon. Uh, it was about 50 years ago, just over 50 years ago, that uh, the first man landed on the moon. The distance to the moon, let's say it's the distance of the length of your playground at the Wolf School. And if it, we were looking for how far it is to the sun, so you've walked the length of the, the playground, standard size playground. If it were a trip to the sun, it would be like walking from Springfield to Branson. So it's a far, far greater distance. So. We talk about our planet and we think about it running around in a circle. We think about sunrise and sunset. Actually, the sun is holding steady. It's us that's moving. So our earth turns around. It makes one turn every 24 hours and that's what makes a day. So the sun is at the top uh, it's right above our uh, head at noon, and the next day at noon, it's the same place. So the earth is turning and the sun is holding still. But here's why the seasons occur. The earth isn't like this picture where it's straight up and down turning. It turns at an angle, like you can see here. So that angle means that over here, the sun is going to be shining on the lower half of what we call the southern hemisphere. And so that's going to be summer then because they're going to have more heat. And the northern hemisphere is getting less. And so it's going to be colder and we call that winter. Here it moves around, here it's spring, and both, both plan, uh, hemispheres get the same amount of sun at that time. Over here, it's summer. So the sun is hitting our northern hemisphere. We're back here on the northern hemisphere and it stays warmer. And down here, they're not getting as much sun. So it's their winter in the southern hemisphere like South America or Australia. So that goes around. That trip takes 365 days, something we call a year. The Earth travels around the sun. It takes one year, one year for the Earth to go all the way around the sun once, one time. And because the Earth is tilted, sort of like a spinning top, parts of the Earth get more heat and light from the sun at different times of the year. You see, spring and summer, fall and winter. Okay, so we talk about the sun comes up and the sun goes down. And as you've just learned, it's not the sun coming up and down. It's the time that we are spinning. In the morning, when the sun comes up, it just means that we've spun around to where the, we're facing the sun. At midnight, we're on the far side and we can't see it. Now, it's also different in different states. So 
the amount of sun that hits Minnesota isn't nearly as much as what hits Florida. So Minnesota is colder. It has deeper snow and snow for much longer. Florida is sunny. We can go down to the beach in the, in the winter uh, and enjoy the sun. And in Missouri, we're kind of in between. So we have really four good distinctive seasons. Now, there are certain plants that require a lot of sun and they're not gonna grow as much in Minnesota or at all. That's the tropical plants. There's other plants that do well in cold weather and short season, and they're gonna be more likely to grow in Minnesota. And we're kind of in between. So we get a little bit of everything here. Plants recognize the number of hours of daylight. And so they have a way of responding when they see that the daylight hours are getting shorter in the fall, and you, you probably notice you get up in the morning in the fall and it's get darker uh, later. And in the winter, it's dark real late. You go to school sometimes in the winter in uh, the dark. That's called photoperiod. And plants adjust to that, their growth to that. So everything has a season. It's got to get through to survive or go extinct. Let's see how some of those do. Here's plants. We have plants that are called annuals, and that means that the plant that you see this year is going to die. You won't see it next year, but it starts off in the spring by putting out fresh leaves and flowers. The flowers are, are uh, going to be pollinated by insects, bees, and uh, butterflies, etc. That pollination will cause the, the flower to create seeds those seeds will fall to the ground in the fall. The plant will shrivel up and die. The seeds stay underground. They develop roots. And then in the springtime, when the soil warms up and it gets at the, they start to grow and they pop out and they have their leaves and those leaves go back bigger and then they have the flowers. So that's one cycle. It's an annual. Now, Many plants are perennial, or that is, they live a number of years. So perennials are plants that store energy in their roots. Uh, tubers, think of uh, carrots and potatoes, are just a glorified storage unit that we happen to eat. Uh, but uh, plants that are perennial, trees, woody shrubs, all have roots, tap roots that go down, and those roots can store energy. So in the wintertime, the, or in the fall, the energy that is created from the leaves up there that are, are photosynthesizing and getting energy goes down into the roots and it's stored there. And then in the springtime, it can go back up. The tree survives because while it may be 10 below zero here and very, very cold and freezing, uh, along the surface here, it tends to be 32, just barely freezing or not at all further down 40, 50 degrees. So around here, we can have a soil temperature of 55 degrees if you go down deep enough over the winter. So the energy is stored in the roots, just like you store energy. If you can think of it like you were uh, getting ready for the winter and so you went out and you bought a bunch of groceries and you put them in your freezer so that you wouldn't have to go out as often. So here's the four seasons, winter, spring where the leaves are starting to come out but not fully out summer they're all bushed out and then fall you can see they're starting to lose their leaves and their color so let's look at a cherry tree the cherry tree has blossoms on it in the spring those blossoms create after they're pollinated they create fruits so they have the fruit the fruit drops off in the autumn or else you go out and pick it in the case of a cherry, and then the leaves fall off for winter and the whole thing starts again. So let's think about why and how those leaves respond that way. Well, when it sees that shortening season, the plants and trees sense the length of daylight and the trees start to lose chlorophyll. Different trees do it at different times. Chlorophyll is that green in the leaf, it's a chemical that takes the sunlight coming in, combines that with the carbon dioxide in the air and creates sugar out of that. 
that sugar creates growth. It's the energy for it to grow. That sugar goes down in the uh, roots. And that sugar also is what a deer eats when a deer's nibbling leaves or buds. It's what a butterfly a larva, a caterpillar eats when it's eating a leaf. And it's what we are eating when we eating vegetables or the fruit like tomatoes that come from vegetables. Now, in the fall, the leaves lose that green and they become yellow or red, depending on the variety of plant and its pigmentation, its uh, other colors within it. And then the leaves fall off. So why would a tree want to lose its leaves? Well, let's think about you. You're going to school and your teacher in the fall gives you a very heavy textbook and she you put it in your backpack and you're carrying it every day and it's heavy. And then one day your teacher says, we're not gonna use that until late spring. Are you gonna carry it all year long? That's a lot of energy, isn't it? Carrying a heavy book you didn't need to, or maybe you're gonna put it on a shelf and wait and in the spring, get it out. That's what a tree is doing because it takes energy to maintain that leaf to have the chlorophyll to transport stuff and it's easier for it to just store it down in its roots and save energy over winter. So that's what the fall color change is about. Chlorophyll is being taken back into the tree and the yellow color, orange color or red as it loses the chlorophyll. Look at an example of this. Here's the Ohio Buckeye. This is a really neat tree and during the winter, it has buds, fall and winter, it has buds here that are going to be the new leaves, flowers, and branches next year. They're covered up by scales here. When the weather changes and it's starting to get longer days with more sunlight, that bud suddenly splits open, all the scales fall off, and here are little tiny leaves that are all ready to grow. And there's a flower right in here that's all ready to grow. And there's the makings of the next stem right here that's going to come off. And within a few weeks, we have these leaves bursting out and then filling up with chlorophyll so that they can metabolize that energy. And here in the summer is the big leaves and flowers. The flowers will be pollinated by butterflies and uh, moths and flies and uh, bees. And when that does, it makes the seed. In this case, the buckeye has one or two bright, shiny, smooth seeds inside here. When you split, when this splits open, it falls to the ground. So how long does an animal live? We've known how they get through with perennial and annual plants. For an animal, the mayfly lives 24 hours in general. Uh, the Galapagos turtle can live up to 177 years at the oldest. This was Lonesome George in the Galapagos that we got to see when he was 90 and he died uh, 10 years later at the age of 100. But the mayfly, if it lives for just 24 hours, how does it survive the winter? Well, here's how it does it. The mayfly comes out, it flies one, maybe two days if it's lucky, it mates, and it immediately drops its uh, uh, eggs into the water, the stream or a pond. And then after two weeks, those eggs hatch. When they hatch, they create this little tiny nymph. Uh, and that nymph will grow in the water. It gets a little bigger, it splits out of its skin. It gets a little bigger, it splits out of its skin. It kind of grows like you might grow if you had a brother or sister that who had clothes or hand-me-downs. When you get your clothes are too tight, you get another shirt or another pair of pants that are bigger. So it does that for up to two years, generally around one year, but it might take two years. So it goes through the winter in the water there where it's not freezing. If it freezes on top, it goes, it's down at the bottom. Then it will form a pupa. It, everything turns within it from this uh, funny looking critter to a mayfly. It flies out, it mates, and the whole thing starts again. 
Now, for other animals that have to survive a season, there are three techniques or a mixture of techniques. They can migrate, they can hibernate, or they can adapt, call adaptation. So let's look at some of those models. Migration, that's when a animal goes from north to south and south to north. So uh, in this case, the monarch is famous for that. It, uh, the, it migrates, it's a complex migration, but it goes from Minnesota all the way down to uh, Mexico where it spends the winter and then it starts moving up the next spring. Uh, the hummingbird here, this hummingbird flies all the way across the Gulf of Mexico, and then it flies back in the spring. And this is a snowy owl. This snowy owl lives in Alaska. And when it becomes winter and it, the food that it fi finds is hiding, it flies down to Missouri and spends the summer here, then goes back up north to Alaska. Most migration is not caused directly by getting out of the cold. It's because it needs food. So the hummingbird feeds off of flowers and those flowers give it energy. But during the winter, do you see flowers out in the field? No, not so much here. So it flies down to South America where it's summer while it's winter here. That's what the monarch butterfly is doing. It needs milkweed. It has to find milkweed where it's growing. And during the winter, there's no growing milkweed. Our friend, the owl here, it is looking for mice, voles, little mammals running around on, uh, on the snow. But when the snow gets deep, they hide under and hibernate. And it has to move south to find food. Now, there are some many uh, different animals that are cold-blooded. That is, you and I, we can make energy by eating. We can warm our bodies up. Shivering is a way of warming our muscles, and our muscles increase our heat. So warm-blooded animals like mammals uh, have one way of getting by. These are reptiles. Here's a ring-necked snake, a leopard frog, our friend the big old snapping turtle, all of them are cold-blooded. They have to control their temperature by moving to where the temperature is comfortable for them. And so many of these will go underground and or under the ice and hide during the winter time. And that's a whole new story. There's all kinds of different ways they do that. Can you think of a large furry mammal that hibernates? Maybe a bear. Yes. So bears hibernate during the winter. They may occasionally get up in warmer weather and go, stretch their muscles a bit, but basically they lay in the cave all winter long. That's a whole long another story for another day. But we'll be getting to bears later. Now, adaptation. Adaptation in animals can be the deer, which will eat tree buds, and uh, looking for things like that to eat. The turkey, which is out looking for uh, acorns, seeds on the ground to survive the winter. Notice how fluffed up that turkey is. By puffing itself up, it puts spe uh, space between its feathers, just like you might put on a puffy coat rather than just a, a uh, uh, jacket, something that has a lot more bulk to it to keep you warmer. Our friend the squirrel here will be busy all fall long picking up acorns and burying them, and then during the winter going back and getting them. And yes, they can remember where they put them. So a squirrel can find most of the, of the nuts that he hides. And also he's going to hit our squirrel-proof feeder, which he's figured out isn't squirrel-proof. He's got a way of getting in there by putting his paw in to keep that spring open. Now, other species have to go over winter in a different way. So let's look at the butterfly. The butterfly, and this is just a generic butterfly, just a, a butterfly. We haven't said what species. A butterfly lays eggs. The eggs hatch into tiny, tiny caterpillars that get bigger split, bigger split, bigger split, four to six times. They're called instars. And finally, they form a pupa. 
That is, they shrivel up into a case. If you were to cut into that case a few days later, you would just find goo. You wouldn't see anything you recognize, but it goes from being a caterpillar in that case over a period of time to being a butterfly. Amazing transition. Uh, just mind blowing how that changes. Now, every butterfly has to go through the winter in one stage or another. So some butterfly species will go as an egg and they'll, they'll hatch their caterpillars in the spring. Uh, other caterpillars will uh, crawl under uh, leaf litter and survive the winter uh, as their method. Some will survive as pupa. That's this case here. So they'll hang there all winter long and then open up into a butterfly. And there are even butterflies that survive the winter as an adult flying around. So my favorite is a goatweed leafwing. It is bright orange when it's flying, but when it lands, so that, and it eats goatweed, that's what its caterpillars eat. So it's a goatweed. The leaf wing refers to the fact that when it lands, it folds up its wings quickly and all you see is a dead leaf. And so if I was a bird and I was following that orange thing and I'm gonna get it I'm, and then it lands, where'd it go? Well, it's hiding. So uh, I actually, uh, I have, uh, I can remember one time in particular where I was out cutting firewood on a uh, warmish uh, winter day, my chainsaw, and I suddenly saw something orange out of the corner of my eye and it was a goatweed leaf wing that was coming up out of the dead bark there and flying away. We have to survive seasons too. So uh, this is our granddaughter out in the, in the snow, uh, one winter with a lot of snow. We can migrate or hibernate and adapt, just like we said. So migration, you can go to Florida where it's warm all winter. And some people actually have houses in Florida or they, they go down and rent a house for the summer for the winter so they can migrate just like we can migrate in the summer up to minnesota because it's cooler and we've had enough heat we can hibernate only when we hibernate it means we go into our house maybe stoke up a fire store our food inside to kind of have some lazy time when we sit around uh, that's our hibernation not true hibernation but it's uh, the same idea or we can adapt. And that is when we go out, uh, put on winter clothes, uh, go out, shovel snow, uh, go for a run, go for a hike, uh, learn to live with it, ski, uh, ice skate, all the kind of things that you can do in the winter. So we go through all of those same things too. So uh, that's all I have for this presentation. Uh, I hope you have some good questions out of that, some things to look at, and you remember the way that our Earth goes around the sun at an angle so that we have four seasons, and we all learn to adapt to those seasons. Goodbye now, some other time. Bye. Okay, am I live now? Yes. <laughs> good, good deal. Okay. I have a Do we have a couple minutes? Um, yeah. Good. Do. Okay. A couple of thoughts that I wanted to go with here. Uh, in case you were wondering why my lips weren't moving during that talk, I listened to the one we did last year, which happened to be recorded. And I thought, I don't think I can do that any better. I really liked it. So that's why I'm doing it this way. Some thoughts that come off of that. I didn't specifically mention, I mentioned that uh, uh, some animals that are cold-blooded have different ways of escaping. Some don't have to escape. Some have antifreeze in their body. And so many insects and uh, some, some frogs and so forth will freeze solid, but it doesn't crack open their cells because they have antifreeze. And so it keeps the, the uh, ice from forming in the cells and they get up, wake up the next year and go back about their body, uh, business. I talked about the complex migration of monarchs and monarchs, uh, 
it's the monarch that, that flies down to Mexico is not the same one that's going to go up to Minnesota. Uh, in the spring, the monarch from Mexico is going to fly up to Texas, that area in the south, lay its eggs, eat, uh, eat its uh, milkweed, and then it's going to, uh, the caterpillars are going to uh, turn into butterflies. It's going to fly up to Springfield. Uh, it's going to go through that same cycle. That butterfly is going to fly up to Minnesota, maybe. Uh, and then that's the butterfly that flies down south. So they that survive as a species because they are, it's their grandchildren and their great grandchildren that are actually flying. And the miracle is that their great great grandchildren know the way back to Mexico. That's, that's part of the magic of it. How and we don't have the slightest idea how that is that that great grandchild that of the grandpa that came from Mexico knows where grandpa lived and flies back down there. It's really cool.